where we're going to start with the Browns and Kevin Stefanski because I think the general consensus is with the arc going down each of his three years here and he started as coach of the year making the playoffs and then he's down now to seven wins. I think the question is and we all know this is a a, a make it year for him. Like if, if things don't go well for Kevin, this is likely his last year with the Browns. What is that bar in your guy's mind? What does he have to achieve? Does he have to get a wild card spot? Does he have to win the division? What is it for you? Is is there even a defined achievement it's, he has to hit? It's so hard to sit here and say you have to hit this because we have no idea our injury is going to play a role. Is anyone going to get hurt of significance? Uh, that obviously changes the scope of things. Listen, if he starts 0 and 5, he's out. Like, can we agree on that? Like, Mid season, you yeah, think they would pull? Yeah. It like, if they get off to a terrible start, if they lose their first four or five games or something like that, he's out. Yeah. Short Especially of the- what happened this year in in, uh, in Jacksonville, or not? Wait, not Jacksonville in um, Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. With, Typically, it tends to be a white flag move when you fire the coach early in the season. Yeah. But they turned things around and damn near got in. And Matt Rule, being at that game, that first game, I left Carolina shaking my head going, this guy's a terrible NFL coach. Right. Like, it was just evident. Some as of the, good as he was in the college right? Oh, but the, he just some of the game management decisions that they made with penalties and clock, and I just didn't understand. I yeah. thought, man, this guy's terrible. So, I mean, the Browns could conceivably try to salvage the season even. Well, at one and four, sure. one and five. Sure. Yeah. It's I a mean, long shot. I, I think like, it would have to be a really, really, really bad start. But, you know, 0 and 5 could get it done. I'm just, just throwing a number out there. Right. But it's sort of like, you know, the Supreme Court's definition of porn. You know it when you see it, right? right. Like, it's hard to sit here and put a number <laughs> on it of, like, if he has to be this, because it, it, it's a sliding scale that changes week to week. Yeah. I, I don't think anyone there wants, obviously, to make any sort of drastic changes. They want this to work. They're going to give them every opportunity for it to work. I think ownership's going to give them every... Remember, we say all the time that the Haslam's have a quick trigger, and they do. Like, they make emotional, reactionary decisions. I've talked to people who worked in the building who said, I had a glowing review, and two weeks later, I got fired with no explanation. Like, that's just the way it operates there. However, they also gave Hugh Jackson an extension after 1-31. and So they try and make it work. Like, they want it to work. The fact that you would extend him after one and thirty-one is kind of insane, but it also tells you like they really don't want to make changes didn't and they want they, it to work. So they want to give Kevin every opportunity didn't to make they it work. At one point, have something like four head coaches on payroll. That would I, someone be, at ESPN Kitchens told would've... me that that with the overlap yeah. of all of the different regimes, that they were paying four head coaches at the same time. Uh, that might have been before I started really getting invested in the Browns. I, I would say this was likely around 14 or 15 I mean, when I was told this. So it was Chud only was there for a year. He was definitely paid for a while. So Petten uh, was somewhere around there. I don't know the chronological order. Yeah, of it I don't even remember. That's when I was either. in the NBA world. But I, I mean, I rem- the person that told me was an NFL reporter for ESPN. Yeah. He knew. Yeah. He knew the financials of the, of the contracts, the structures. And he told me, he goes, you know, I know this will make you feel real good, but your team's paying four head coaches. That's incredible. Three of which they fired. That's, that's incredible. That's tough it's, it, well, it tells you how bad the decision-making has been. Yes. And also to the quick trigger. Point. And that also, if you're talking 14-15, that was early in the Haslam reign. Right. Like they would have just would've gotten, because they've he's had it for 10 years. Like okay. this is the 10th year. They've, had, they've owned the team for 10 years. So I think early on, they really didn't know what they were doing. They, they said as much. I've talked about it on the show. Right. They said, we didn't know what we were doing. We thought this was easy being in Pittsburgh. So, I, and I think the longer that they've been here, they've tried not to make some of those emotional reactionary decisions. And they have gotten better in that. They in, want in it that to vein. work. Yeah, they want it to work. Freddie was an absolute disaster. He had, it was, evident. I mean, I wrote after three games, this guy didn't know what he's doing. I wrote halfway through the year, he's got to be fired yeah. one year or not. So that was an absolute disaster. They were trusting Dorsey, and he led him astray on that. But for the most part, they've gotten to the point where they don't want to fire these people as quickly as they did early. So in you don't regime. think it's necessarily let's, – let's say he does make it through the whole season. Is there a scenario – you mentioned injuries where he they just miss the playoffs again and he still comes back? Yeah, there has. I mean, like let's say Watson plays seven games and has a high ankle sprain, misses five weeks, comes back. He's not the same player before. Right. If they looked good in those first six, seven games with him and then they kind of falter without him, and I don't think there's a way they bring Jacoby Brissett back, whatever their backup quarterback situation is going to be is going to be a cheap either rookie contract or Kellen Mond. And with all due respect to Kellen Mond, who I covered at A&M, who I love, he'd be a great interview on the show, by the way. We've got to get, I'll, I'll get Kellen Mond on. All but right, great. 
he's not winning games in the NFL right now. With, no. with even with the talent but around remember, him. Remember, if you would have if you would have asked at the beginning of this season about the situation in San Francisco, you would have said, "Well, gosh, well, God forbid they ever need right. to call on Brock that's, Purdy." That's very fair. That's so fair. we don't we don't really know. And, and Kevin do, Kevin's great with quarterbacks. And I do think, regardless of circumstance, it doesn't matter what the reasoning is. If this team fails to make the playoffs, I I get very concerned at that point about. Miles Garrett's mindset, Nick Chubb's mindset, right. these guys that watching their career take yes, away. Yeah. Yes, watching it just spiral the drain. I mean, we mentioned it yesterday on the show. In my opinion, there's three future Hall of Famers on this roster. And I, I you know, I mean Joel Batonio, the the Hayes in the barn at this point, he's already in his thirties. He's toward the end of his career. Yeah, he's almost rubber stamped. Yeah, he's not going anywhere. But the other two, you know, Miles and Nick have some productive years ahead of them. And I just yeah. wonder where their mindset will be if this team, for whatever reason, the reasons don't matter, if they miss yeah. the playoffs again next you know, year, where they would be. You, you t- uh, let's hope that, 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 that there's more playoff wins in the future for those three guys. But if you just take a look at the Joe Thomas, who played in zero playoff games, yeah. if you look at Joe Thomas, Joel Batonio, Miles Garrett, and Nick Chubb, should all four of them play the rest of their careers, you know, here, the three, get into the Hall of Fame, to have four Hall of Famers on your roster in a 15-year span and win one playoff game? Unacceptable. That might be the biggest indictment of an organization Absolutely. ever. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Earl, when he asked this question, he said AFC Championship game was the level that his that mind— That was where his bar was and, set. And, and, I thought that was high, which is why I didn't ask it that way. No disrespect to you, but the question really was, do they have to make it to the AFC Championship game for Kevin Stefanski to keep his job? I think that's high. Buffalo, Kansas City, Cincinnati. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, you yeah. think be better you, than two of those playoffs, three teams. Win a wild card round. Yeah. Lose in the divisional round like they did in his first year. That's progress. Yeah. And I don't think there's any way they can fire him if they do that. I think Jason hit it on the, the head right there with the AFC Championship game part of this in particular. You have to be better to make the AFC Championship than two of either Cincinnati, Buffalo, or Kansas City. You definitely have to beat one of them. You definitely yeah, have to beat one to. of them. You're going to have to. You can't you have to beat one. We have to be better than two to get there. Game. And you might, well, I guess you Kansas might have City, to beat two. Kansas City could get the by Buffalo plays. You know, maybe I guess there's yeah, a but game. You have to be better one than, of them before you get yes. to the championship And they have to be better game. in totality at that point of the season than at least two of those three teams. Yeah. Because we're just penciling in one of those three. Who knows what happens next year? Like, Mahomes may never be the – like, I'm just saying – Right, but you have to be in theory better than two of those three teams, and I don't see in one off season with all the holes currently on this Browns roster them leapfrogging two of those three teams and to pencil them in a spot in the AFC Championship game. And so it would be the equivalent of where the Bills are right now. They didn't make the championship game. Right. Was their season a success? No. No, because coming in, their goal was Super Bowl. Yes. And they had a team that was built to go there. I don't know that realistically, no matter what the Browns do in this offseason, anybody's going to be putting them in the Super Bowl next year. I don't know what moves they can make between now and September that any right-minded journalist, expert, could say, my pick in the AFC is the Browns. Like, that's just, there's too big a gap right, right now. Right. Can I try to defend it real quick? Go yeah. ahead, sure. Please. I'm surprised that you didn't uh, agree with me, Jay. I thought you would actually be, be leaning more towards me. So Stefanski has been here three years. Right. The very first season, the Browns made the playoffs, and they won a playoff game. Yeah. So you set the bar for the bare minimum year one. Since then, the Browns have not even made the playoffs. If you look at the 2023 season, the season after that, I think Nick Chubb will have one more year on this contract. Omari will have one more year on this contract. Miles is going to be getting older, et cetera. I'm looking at this situation to where you're paying Deshaun Watson $230 million. Right. You have your core players that's on the back end of their current contract deals that you have to get to at least that point to show that everything that Andrew Barry and Jimmy Haslam have invested in, that you can lead them to the Well, let me ask you this, Earl. Are they making that kind of a decision in Buffalo this morning? No, but they Sean McDermott have more of a proven track record than Kevin Stefanski does. That's true. That's However, considering where the Browns are coming from, they're coming from a 7-10. and 10. And I just think that I'm trying to be realistic. Listen, I'm a demanding fan. Hell, I don't want anything less than a Super Bowl, truth be told. But at the same time, I'm trying to figure out, is this the guy that's the right guy moving forward? And if he can show enough improvement 
from 7 and 10 to say 12 and 5, even 11 and 6, get in the playoffs, win a game. That's my kind of bare minimum. I think you have to get in the playoffs and beat a team. I do. He did that in year one, coming from nowhere. So I want to see them do that now. And if they don't, it's going to be a disappointment for me. Ultimately, the question Jimmy has to answer is, are we going in the right direction? And clearly, if they turn things around enough where they're plus four in the wins, that's that's pretty significant. To your point, Buffalo hasn't made the conference championship game but once. One time. One time. With this regime. Which and they've got of, talent. Yeah, they've got a ton of talent. And they've missed the – they haven't even made it to the title game, right. AFC title game, the last two years. So it's it's hard to even get to that point. You know, we look at 2020 and go, man, the Browns were just a couple plays away from the AFC title game. And they were. And they were. And that's true. But that doesn't necessarily guarantee you're going to replicate that success. I'm glad you said that because one of the points I wanted to get to in this conversation is that success and failure year to year doesn't slingshot you into the same predicament the next year. Especially in the and, NFL. And especially, probably more so in the NFL. Than than, any sport. Agreed. Remember at the beginning of this season where Jacksonville was. Absolutely. And I know they won a, a bad division. But guys, they came within a whisker of beating – the team so I said they were the favorite. Browns of 2020. They were the Browns of 2020. So Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to duplicate that success next year. And if you, for a second, ride into 2023 training camp, Jacksonville, and think we're on our high horse, right. we got it done in 22, now we take the next step, it doesn't go that way. So And, and, and conversely, the other way, just because you were 7-10, and 10, how many times have we te- seen teams finish 4 or 5 under 500 in the next year they're a contender. Well, every, every year, there's a last place team in the NFL that miraculously turns around, makes the playoffs. Worst of Jackson, first. Jacksonville was this year. Yep. And in football, more than any other sport. And the Rams were first. And, and the first to worst. worst. Yeah. But in football, more than any other sport, players can either fall off a cliff or accelerate faster. Yeah. You, in the NBA, like LeBron may have taken a step back as he gets older. He's still a top 10 player in the league. Sure. When guys get older, they don't usually go from very good to unplayable. Quickly. In the NFL, we see it every year where guys go from, hey, they were a key contributor on this team to now we have a seventh-round rookie who's outperforming him for much cheaper. Which yeah, it's is easier cut. to age out for sure. And also in the NFL, the, the way the schedule sets up, if you're a last-place team, you play a last-place schedule, schedule the next right, year. which is going to benefit, benefit them great. Absolutely. I keep looking at their schedule. I've looked at it three or four times. And you every said 17-0, time, right? Well, <laughs> believe me, I'm not, I'm not G. Bush. I'm not drinking <laughs> that kind of Kool-Aid. But when I look at the schedule, I – I have a huge smile on my head, allegedly. I have a huge smile on my face because there are a lot of teams that they will play next year that did not play in the playoffs this year. Can we make, real quick, can we go back for one sec? Can yeah. we make a prediction? What do you think G. Bush's 2023 Brown season prediction is going to be? I'm going 14 15, and two. I'm going 15 and 2. Well, it's going to change 17 times between now and <laughs> September. Yeah, because True. he is so <laughs> emotional. He calls himself the, the, the Duke of, uh, yeah. what is he? The, the Duke, Duke of Niger. Duke of Niger. 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 Yeah. <laughs> He, he really does, man. He is an emotional cat. That's how I was when I was, like, in my 20s and 30s with the Browns. Yeah. You know, the cycle of madness on Sunday you lose. Monday you hate the team. Tuesday you don't want to talk about it. Wednesday you're looking at the opponent. Thursday you're thinking they're not that good. Friday you're like, wow, we had a good week of practice. Saturday, like, we got this. Sunday yeah. you lose. Repeat. All over again. Wash, rinse, yeah. repeat. G brought that up before the season, that cycle, which I guess is more – built into Browns fans' DNA than oh, it is anywhere it really else. Is. I've, I've been on any any sport. Yeah. Uh, I saw it firsthand this year. It, it's real. Like, that that cycle is Absolutely. Scary. As an yeah. outsider now witnessing one Brown season mm-hmm. up close, like, if you had to write a couple of paragraphs of the Browns football experience, how do you encapsulate what you just watched? Well, it's part of my stand-up routine, so I don't want to give it all away. <laughs> but <laughs> okay, it's, it's joyous pain. It's like when you enjoy inflicting self-pain. So it's almost like masochism. Is that what the word is? Yeah, I could have yeah. Right. yeah, masochism. Yeah. You know what's amazing is... That's well said, actually. Coming, from, I mean, the NBA is such a... It's such a social media-driven league, and there's so much zaniness and craziness that goes on in the NBA than any other sport. Yeah. When I came over to the Browns, and everyone's like, just wait, just wait. I'm like, man, come on. I had LeBron you for four be, years. Yeah, right. There ain't nothing I ain't seen. And I sit here every week and go, oh, my God. God, they were right. Like, this is insane. Well, I, I tweeted out what a, after. What a pitiful place Brown's Twitter is. <laughs> it is. It will. You got to stay away from sharp objects when you go in there. I tweeted out. I forget what game it was after, but I was like, I'm, sh- I'm shocked anyone in Cleveland lives past the age of 50 with how much physical toll and emotional pain the Browns inflicted them week after week. 
And it was funny. Channel 19 ran it. They had no idea who I was. And I know people over there who, like, just like us, we can't run other stuff. They, like, don't want to run Channel these stuff. And it was the lead tweet on their sports show that oh. night, which was awesome because oh. Mikey McNuggets doesn't scream I work at Channel 3, but ha-ha, got you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sucks to suck, 19. But, uh, <laughs> but it, like, I give Browns fans the – and I'm, I'm like a half Browns fan now. Like, I, you know, I'm from New Jersey. You Giants, get invested semi, but you're here. It, anywhere you work, you want the team you cover yes. to win. It's so much more fun to cover a winning. Jason Otest is anywhere he's been. When I was in Tennessee, I wanted the Titans to win. It was good for business. When I was in Texas – Screw the Cowboys. Never wanted you to win. But <laughs> here, good. I want the Browns to win. Like, it's good for us if they win. Yes, and I feel the pain when they lose because then I have to come on and host a postgame show. And then I have G. Bush going crazy. And I'm like, <laughs> well, if G. Bush is at that level, I can't be just calm. Like, I got to be invested. So I got invested. And then, yeah, the Browns hurt me too. It sucks. So, G. Bush, get back to the original question. My guess would be he would guess like 10 and 7. I'm going to text him right now. I'll see if we get an answer by the end of the show. All right. I oh, would say he, 10 and you'll 7. You'll get one by tomorrow. But. By tomorrow. By tomorrow. Slow yeah. on yeah. Text. But. By September, he'll be 15 and 2. 16 and 1, 15 yeah. and 2. And then by it's week just going to ramp up. And then by week three, he'll be 2 and 4. Two and <laughs> <laughs> I love his volatility. I love his emotion. I, because I, that was me for so long. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, when I moved to Tampa um, to work at ABC there, uh, the just Browns text, lost just their team. Me. Just text. Okay. The Browns they had no team. Yeah. So I wasn't, you know. I mean, I had one rooting interest for the years that the Browns were gone. Whoever the Ravens played. Yep. I was, I mean, they were my favorite team for three years. But when I worked in Tampa, you get to know the guys. They were great guys. They were all-time great defense. Tony Dungy was incredible. Treated the media. When he was fired, I've never seen this, and I wonder if you have. The day he was fired, he told the media relations guy for the Bucks, I want all the regulars, the main TV guys, all the beat writers, to – come through my office one-on-one. -on -one. I want to I want to thank them one-on-one. -on -one. No. Now, cool. the man had just been fired. He yeah. sat in his office. There was a line. It was almost, I felt like it was almost like a receiving line at a wake. Yeah. It yeah. was the most bizarre thing I'd ever Here's some baked been beans. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for your loss. <laughs> <laughs> and one by I'm one, each of us came through the office, and we pulled the door shut behind us, and he, you know, he was like, you know, you've always treated me fairly. I want to thank you for all you've done. You know, I had done some work with his charity foundation, his Family First Foundation, so he and I had a pretty good relationship outside of the football piece. But to, for a coach to do that, yeah. it was unbelievable. So in those years where there was no Browns, I was like, hell, I mean, not that I root for anybody as a journalist, but it was fun to watch the team I covered win a Super Bowl. Sure. While I was covering, yeah. it was a hell of a ride. Like yeah. you and 16 with the Cavs. Oh, yeah. It might be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. 100%.